Recently, I had the opportunity to discuss with atheist Matt Dillhunty on whether religion is overall socially beneficial or harmful. I thought that since the question is a testable hypothesis, the outcome of our debate would depend on citing scientific evidence. So before the debate, I did my best to try to go over published studies which looked at the social effects of religion, and I identified a pretty clear trend. While there were some exceptions, the vast majority of studies showed that religiosity is tied to positive social outcomes. For example, a paper published in 2009 combined the findings of all the previous studies on the link between crime and religion. It found that religiosity was associated with lower rates of crime and delinquency. Also, religion was associated with lower rates of premarital sex, drug use, and divorce. To my surprise, Matt seemed totally unfamiliar with the vast scientific literature on this topic and instead spent a lot of his time arguing from incredulity and thought experiments. However, Dillhunty did cite one paper to back up his case. He referenced a paper authored by Gregory Paul, a paleontologist, on the cross-national quantifiable effects of religion. First of all, the results of a single study is not enough to overturn the findings from dozens of other studies. The most we could do is extract the findings from Paul's study and combine it into a pool with other studies and see how it affects the results. And that would probably not affect the results, because one study is very unlikely to buckle a trend found in a meta-analysis, like this one which was based on 62 other studies. Second, Paul's paper is not actually a scientific study. In figure 2 we can see his main results. We can see that his findings are based on a scatter plot with no statistical analysis at all. He tries to identify a correlation between crime and religion through a visual inspection of the scattered plots alone. Any serious social scientist would not try to do this, and instead they would analyze the data mathematically to derive statistical measures of the correlations between the two variables. And this is because visual inspections are prone to errors. Since Paul's paper has no statistical analysis, we don't even know if his results are statistically significant. Second, the paper is a univariate analysis of the trends. A univariate analysis tries to correlate one variable to another without taking into account other variables, which could affect the results. No serious social scientist does a univariate analysis of the data and expects meaningful results. For instance, while crime does appear to be higher in the U.S. when compared to a country like Germany, the U.S. has a higher birth rate, and so there is a higher percentage of young adults who are more likely to commit a crime in the first place, irrespective of religion. Univariate analyses are prone to fallacious conclusions, and so social scientists invariably prefer multivariate analyses, taking into account variables which differ between two countries that could independently affect crime rates such as age, economic disparity, availability of guns, etc. Third, there's evidence that when one looks at people living in these countries, at an individual level as opposed to a national level, religion is still tied to lower criminality. Fourth, as many people have pointed out, this could be a reverse causation. For example, people who are extrinsically religious, whose primary motivation for religion is some health or economic benefits, are less likely to be religious in prosperous countries because they have less economic benefit to derive from religion. And so, because of that fact, there's zero reasons to take Paul's paper seriously. Even Matt Dillhunty quietly stopped defending this paper for the rest of the debate. Matt then attempted a different argument. Um, I think there may be an attribution error in the studies as, as well, uh, in the other direction, um, because if someone who reports that they are more religious is less likely to commit a crime, how do we know that religiosity is in fact the uh, motivating thing there? In this clip, Matt is just showing how little research he has done in this area. There have been a multitude of studies showing that a link between religion and positive social outcomes is not only mere association, it's actually a causal relationship. For instance, one way religion is thought to reduce crime rates is by increasing self-control. There have been at least a half a dozen studies showing that a religious stimulus actually increases self-control at a neurophysiological level. Here's one interesting study which was published in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. In this study, subjects were divided into two groups. Group 1 had a brief prayer session before the experiment, while the control group did not. Next, both groups completed the Stroop task, which is an experimental measure of self-control. In the Stroop's trial, a stimulus appeared in blue, red, or yellow ink, and participants were instructed to react to the ink color and ignore the semantic meaning of the stimulus. 
In incongruent trials, the semantic meaning of the word did not match the ink color. The strip task requires self-control, because on incongruent trials, participants need to override dominant response tendency of reacting to the semantic meaning of the presented word and indicate the ink color instead. The authors found that a brief prayer session actually increased performance on the Stroop task, which is the neurophysiological correlate of self-control. Similar results have been replicated in numerous trials, which showed that exposing people to religious words without their explicit knowledge increased helping behavior and volunteering, as well as decreasing cheating. Contrary to Dale Hunty, the literature on the causal effects of religion on self-control is robust and well replicated. Dill Hunty really did not cite any sufficient evidence to back up his claim. To say that, in all these instances where someone is wet, we saw that it was raining. And then to say that if we remove the rain, people won't be wet. That is essentially the, the path we're going down with this sort of argument. In this clip, I believe his argument here is that I'm committing the fallacy called affirming the consequence. An example of this is, if it rains, the ground is wet. It has not rained, therefore the ground is not wet. Matt's point here seems to be that even if we have good evidence that religion makes people more ethical and decreases crime, that doesn't necessarily entail that a lack of religion will result in increased crime or harmful outcomes. But this is sort of a straw man of my argument. As I tried to explain to him, I wasn't arguing that the evidence we have necessarily entails that a lack of religion will result in harmful social outcomes. My point was that a lack of religion is likely to lead to negative social outcomes. In science, we can never conclude that anything is 100% certain. It is not a fallacy of the consequence to say that we have observed that if it rains, the streets will likely be wet. Therefore, if it doesn't rain, the streets are less likely to be wet. In the same way, we can also conclude that based on the evidence, if religion were to be eradicated from society, it is more likely people won't act in socially desirable ways. Matt seems to have completely missed the point here. However, after this, Matt tried a pretty bizarre thought experiment. We can have a hospital that does not adhere to any religious doctrine, and it will be better than a hospital that does adhere to religious doctrine, because the hospital without religious doctrine will be purely based on good, sound medical information and will not be adding in doctrinal things that are in opposition to science. So the hospital has to be better. There are also people who think that you know, having these religious ceremonies for the afterbirth after a miscarriage uh, is a good thing because they're appealing to their God. And yet I would completely disagree that this is a good thing at all. They are traumatizing a woman who just suffered a miscarriage. So he seems to be saying results from Catholic hospitals are worse than secular hospitals because Catholic hospitals force their doctrine onto people. And he implies Catholic hospitals are potentially doing something harmful by causing emotional trauma to patients by requiring funerals for deceased fetuses, even though there's no evidence this is the policy at Catholic hospitals across the board. So even if Matt had some data to suggest that Catholic and secular hospitals are equal or Catholic hospitals are worse, that would not in any way entail that society as a whole could have a secular system in place, which would result in the same benefits that intrinsic religiosity has given us. Also, his whole premise completely backfires on him. His argument seems to be that secular hospitals are overall better because they have the same outcomes, but incidences like fetal funerals do not happen in secular hospitals, even though there's no data showing this is happening through Catholic hospitals on large scales. Plus, he has not offered statistical evidence that overall Catholic hospitals are the same or even worse than secular hospitals. Marginal examples do not represent what is happening on a whole. It would have been just as bad if I had said, that secular hospitals are worse than Catholic hospitals because there have been instances where babies survive botched abortions and they are left out for dead. Or if I argued from something like what happened with the incident involving Alfie Evans at a non-religious hospital. This never would have happened at a Catholic hospital because all human lives are sacred to Catholics, so therefore religion is far better in hospitals. Instead, though, I tried to base my arguments on the data, not on thought experiments and marginal examples. But this did get me thinking. Matt seems to assume Catholic hospitals are worse because of his story, not because of any real scientific data. I did press him for data on this, but he couldn't seem to provide any. So I started to wonder if there was actual data on Catholic versus secular hospitals. Well, after talking with a friend who works in the medical field, I actually did find some data on this. 
Scientists have looked at patient outcomes at secular versus Catholic hospitals and found there is no data to support the notion that Catholic hospitals have lower patient satisfaction or cause more harm than secular hospitals. In fact, the overall analysis noted Catholic hospitals actually maintain an advantage in patient quality measures. The recent Reuters study, 2010, ranked hospitals on a set of system performance indicators, including mortality, complication, and readmission rates, patient safety and quality performance measures, and HCAP scores. The average rank of the 36 Catholic operated healthcare systems was 84 out of 255, whereas the average rank of non-Catholic operated systems was 129. Moreover, two Catholic operated hospital systems were ranked among the top 10 in the country in terms of quality and efficient performance. So the data completely contradicts Matt's case. He has no concrete evidence for any of his claims and diverged away from the original topic quite often. Matt also tried to claim religion is dying out. I tried to address this briefly during the debate, but I didn't get a chance to make my case. In reality, religion is not dying out, despite the charismatic speeches from new atheists. Globally, the unaffiliated is expected to decrease as a percentage of world population. Pew Research notes that by 2035, unaffiliated deaths in Europe are expected to outnumber births there as well. Sociologist Eric Kaufman also notes that Christianity and Islam will continue to grow from conversions and birth rates, as groups with no religion are expected to decline. This coheres with what evolutionary biologist Michael Bloom has noted in his work, that religion, if it ever will die out, will not be for a very, very long time, because from an evolutionary standpoint, it is selected for its reproductive benefits. Statistics always show that religious couples have more children than non-religious couples. So in other words, Bloom argues religion has evolutionary benefits that cause it to continue to flourish in humans, mainly its reproductive benefits. So religion is not dying out by any scientific assessment. So sorry Matt, the science is not on your side in any way. Religion does cause immense benefits for human societies, and just ad hoc asserting we would be better without it is not factual or based on science. Now you can believe all you want that religion is really harmful and causes more damage than good, but that is all it is, a belief based on speculation and blind faith. If your entire argument that religion is more harmful is based on marginal examples and thought experiments, then we have to wonder how much of what you believe is based on facts or based on personal feelings about the whole situation.